is uh, potentials for a new age of steam. Now, Titanic was uh, a major uh, piece of industrial heritage, and in Belfast there's just been a new museum opened. 100 million euros has been spent on that museum to celebrate a huge um, United Kingdom heritage engineering disaster. <laughs> it's something we've all heard of. But in Britain, there are lots and lots of heritage operations, particularly associated with technological heritage, transport heritage. The heritage railway industry really started in Britain with the Tallylin Railway. That was the railway that you were seeing in that little movie. Uh, as it was back in 1951, when it went into volunteer ownership, run by uh, a set of people who had nothing to do with major railways or anything like that before. They were just enthusiasts for railways. It was a two foot three gauge, uh, ran for 7.25 miles, originally built in 1866. And it was transferred in 1951 into volunteer ownership. In 2006, it carried 51,000 passengers. 2010, it carried 85,000 passengers. It has 16 locomotives um, and four diesel locomotives and has 23 carriages. And it's part of what happened in Britain about 50 to 60 years ago that there was a major redevelopment of the railway network. Suddenly the government decided it was going to get rid of lots of branch lines and that this chap, Dr. Beeching, wrote a report in 19... 63, um, and there was a massive closure of railways right throughout uh, the United Kingdom. So, after coming into nationalisation in 1948, by the mid-1950s and 1960s, there were lots of railway lines being closed down, and consequently they became available. So, a quick bit of GIS, there's Britain, put in the current heritage <coughs> railways in Britain. I've got 162 in my list. So in Britain, we are decidedly um, mad about uh, uh, historic trains, add in some uh, historic transport museums as well, and there's another 119 of those. And you can see there's a lot of heritage operation going on in Britain. And the thing about this is that Britain has over 150 preserved railways. They generate 15 million tourist um, visits per year. The industry as a whole employs some 2,000 people directly and engages a further 18,000 volunteers. It is big business. It contributes, and this is from Lord Faulkner, his figures, so official government figures, £579 million to the British economy. And that is just heritage railways. Every year? Every year. This is big, big business. It plays a very important part in the extensive cultural and heritage uh, tourism industry in Britain. There are a lot of people like me who go visiting railways. This is my holiday stamps. It's when my family <laughs> allow me to go and visit heritage railways. That's the one just down the road from me at home. Now, there's an overarching body that looks after the heritage railway operations in Britain called the Heritage Railway Association. Uh, and they, they start looking at uh, the management of the business and so on across the whole of the country and across all of the operations. And they reckon that the combined input of the uh, uh, heritage railways into the local economy, that's the economy immediately around those individual operations is some £115 million pounds per year. And that is through people coming to the railways, having uh, tea and coffee and going to restaurants in the area. Also, volunteers coming and staying in the vicinity whilst they work free on the railway to do things like lay track or operate the trains, be the railway guard, be the signalman and so on. And people come to some of these heritage railways from literally all over the world to spend their summer holidays or other holidays being a railwayman. Sometimes for the great privileged ones, that's driving the trains and so on. And they give a lot of pleasure to a lot of people through their volunteering. They also create a lot of interest in themselves. 
There are the, these are the passenger figures for the 30 largest standard gauge railways in Britain for 2009, 2010, and they total four and a half million passenger journeys just on those 30 railways alone. Now, I'm interested particularly in old ships, the Mary Rose project you may remember from last year. That was done through volunteer divers working on the site, free, excavating the remains of the ship on the seabed. And again, these are people who came from all over the world, came to Portsmouth, stayed in Portsmouth, did a couple of weeks of diving off the ship down in the dark and the mud on the bottom of the Solent, putting enormous effort in to raise fantastic objects from the seabed of the Solent. These objects, everyday domestic items from 1545, from Henry VIII's warship. All those navigational instruments, the device in the middle is in fact a way of calculating tidal times. Um, and there were people who got enthused and came from other places. Uh, Dr. Harold Edgerton from MIT <laughs> flew over uh, at the request of Alexander McKee to come and try out his sonar device going across the site. And lo and behold, back in the 60s, he found it. Mm -hmm. So these projects are very dependent on people's goodwill. They're also very dependent on people of note. Um, he came down to lay the foundation stone for our new museum. Luckily on that day he kept his clothes on. <laughs> our new museum is almost finished. This is me in the uh, lobby of our new museum. Um, this is the chief executive and again another person to <coughs> note. This is Chris Sanson in the centre who is a, a historical novelist. Uh, he writes the Shard Lake novels, and they've been sold by the millions around the world. Uh, and people like that add to our projects. <laughs> we have lots of projects in Portsmouth. HMS Warrior, 1860, the first iron hulled battleship in the world. And there we are being visited by Eduardo and, and Co. And there's Richard and, and, and my father. Now, my father has been a volunteer on HMS Warrior for the past 25 years since he retired from being school teacher. He has given his retirement to the enjoyment and the activity of other people. He's had a tremendous time out of that. He's written papers, he's written books and so on. He's in a position where he can tell people about things, and there he is telling uh, Leonor uh, all about the, the uh, parts of the ship and the issue of room. And it is a fantastic ship. It's big, it's a big heritage project. It required a lot of money, but that was all raised through voluntary subscriptions, not from state funding. Um, it was supported by, in this case, the Duke of Edinburgh, who was the focus for uh, uh, fundraising activities and so on. And that's right down inside, in this, there's Eduardo going through the boiler room. There's the engines and on the main gun deck. So these are large operations in the dockyard. There are also small ones, um, small historic boats, air sea rescue boat and a seaplane tender, for example, there. And those are owned by a charitable trust. They are operated and maintained and restored by volunteers. People who used to work in the dockyard who now use their retired skills, their skills of a lifetime, to keep the boats going, keep them operational. I've been able to take my students out on these, and it's fantastic. Get out there on the water, open the engines up, and wow, that's fun. <laughs> there are lots of these boats. There's a 1940s motor gunboat, uh, and it's all done by volunteers who give their time to work, and sometimes do really hard, physical, dirty work on these vessels. Now, in heritage railway terms, Britain has a huge variety of different uh, uh, railway activities. It's got um, such things as this one, the Volks Railway in Brighton, built more than 100 years ago as a demonstration of the power of electricity. It still runs. It's an easy to keep going operation because it's electrically operated trains. Maintenance levels are really not a problem. It's all run by volunteers. Now, there are others that I've visited. Uh, this one, the Fintown Railway in County Donegal in uh, ERA in the Republic of Ireland. It is just about as far away from anywhere in the European Union as you can get. Um, out on the west, right out on the west of Ireland. 
It's in an area called, uh, which is designated as Gaeltauk, uh, which is a, a Gaelic-speaking area, so it receives government money to help <coughs> develop the uh, tourism in the area. And what they have is a, a 1940s diesel car and a 2007 modern diesel locomotive that they use to haul uh, a single carriage up and down the line. It's not terribly dynamic, but it's very cheap to operate. It's cheap to operate and people will still go to it. It's got nice scenery that it goes through. I went there on a nice wet day with my family and we had a look around and some of their other exhibits are, well, they're not expensive exhibits. Um, they're interesting to somebody like me who likes looking at bits of old machinery. That's fantastic. So things don't have to be shiny. They don't have to be fully developed. They can sometimes be quite simple. Another one we went to was the Downpatrick and County Down Railway. Um, this is a slightly larger operation in that it's standard gauge, <coughs> eight and a half. It is run by a charitable trust, a not-for-profit society, has a membership of 200. And this is in Northern Ireland, in Ulster, a place where there's been enormous um, inter-community uh, inter <coughs> strife for the last 40 years. So it's a place where people don't generally come together terribly much between their communities. But through uh, the railway there, they have done so. And again, they've been able to get together a quite a lot of really interesting machinery. Uh, this uh, <coughs> railway uh, <coughs> locomotive from the Irish Railways, it was given to them. They operate over a very short piece of track. It's literally only about three or four kilometers. But they have a station here and a loop that goes around to Inch Abbey, another line that goes on up uh, towards a halt, not yet quite complete. Um, but they've got what is potentially a railway triangle at the top there. And I was talking with the, uh, the driver of the train, who incidentally um, is an aerospace engineer, works in Belfast. And he was telling me that, yeah, this is great, because although you've only got a small bit of track, You've got lots of things to do with railway business. Lots of signals, lots of points, switches, that you can go from one track to another. You can drag the, the carriages up the line. It doesn't need to go fast. The track's not in fantastic condition, but that's fine. Everybody has great fun, and it all works. And they've also got <coughs> on the site uh, a new building with uh, a railway museum, in, including this steam locomotive, which is uh, 135 years old modern diesel rail car, old carriages and so on, all of which are being rebuilt by volunteers. They also have their fair share of uh, other pieces of equipment lying around in the site, and it's great fun. That's me, yeah. with my eldest son Lawrence there. Now, other types of railway and other ways of doing this sort of thing, the Romney Hyde and Dimchurch Railway in Kent runs from here to here. It starts right by a nuclear power station, so, that, you know, that's not been a problem for it. It runs with specially built locomotives. It was established in 1927 uh, by uh, Captain Howie and Count Louis Zabrowski, both notable as uh, racing drivers. They tried to buy the Reagan Glass and Eskdale Railway in the uh, Lake District but failed, so they thought they'd build this one instead. And the thing about it is, it's very detailed. It's a fantastic piece of railway engineering, but it's small. It keeps the costs down. It makes it possible to run things without spending huge amounts of money on the locomotives, on the fuel, or anything like that. It really does have the feel of a full-scale railway, but in miniature. And that miniature nature means that the track is cheap, the track maintenance is cheap, the locomotives are cheap, uh, and so on. And they've been running these locomotives <coughs> since 1927. Built specially for the route. There's Cheryl, so she's having a ride with me. She was very indulgent to me that day. Um, there we are. In the, uh, <laughs> right, okay. I'll just move past that. Now, I live on the Isle of Wight, which is off the south coast of England. It had an extensive railway network in the 1860s. It now just has a line that runs from the right pier head down to Shanklin down here and another run that goes from here across to, to there at Wooten. It was a fully developed local railway network, yeah, 
and is now very much part of the heritage operations on the island. We have electric trains running on this part, which is still run as a proper public railway, and steam trains on the uh, Haven Street route. There's the electric trains that we use, built in 1938. That's mainline. That's the oldest running rail rolling stock in Britain. It's very detailed. There's lots of things there. The steam railway was set up really as a result of two teenagers, so they were about 18 or 19 at the time, back in the mid-1960s, who decided to, to try and preserve some locomotives on the Isle of Wight. And they did, and that's grown into a major tourist operation. They even bring in special trains with uh, faces on the front from the Reverend W. Audrey's books, there's Thomas the Tank Engine, arriving by low loader, just for two days of steaming. Mm. You imagine the costs involved in doing that, bringing it over and running it. They also run steam fares with traction engines and other things like that. And again, people come from all over the world. <laughs> they come for a ride on the steam trains. And look at the railway business going on, you know, adding water, but it's all supported by volunteers. Now, they have ridership, so these are 2012 figures, but generally, June, there's about 500 uh, journeys a day. So that's 500 by about 10 pounds a piece, so you're looking at about 5,000 pounds income a day. It's not bad. Different version, uh, this is the Brewer Valley in uh, Norfolk. It's a 15 inch railway built along the line of a standard gauge track. It's new, they're modern locos, they're new, brand new built locos, so there's no problems about maintenance and things like that. There's a whole railway industry in Britain that builds these things. And one of the interesting things here is that because it was built on a standard gauge route, they've got the narrow gauge track and down alongside it, a uh, uh, path and cycle path, and so on. Um, there's me with my mum having a ride on that. Now, on that railway, you can go and do a day's training and become a railway driver. Uh, the course costs £800, so about €1,000 for a day's train driving. And you have to do two courses before they'll let you do that one. So there's a lot of money in it. Now, this area, the steam trains are famous. You can even buy books about this place in England. You know, about the engines here, they were running until uh, the 1970s, in some cases even the 1980s. It's got fabulous scenery, it's got wonderful, wonderful locations, it's got a lot of infrastructure that's still there, still intact, with lots of uh, railway business that can be built into it, all around a Fabulous location, as I'm sure you'd all agree. Some parts are still running with the diesel rail cars up at Mirandella, um, but other parts aren't. And we've got rolling stock, we have railways, we have locomotives, all sitting there. It seems to me rather sad that they sit there in such a beautiful, um, long heritage railway location. I thought, well, you know, it would be really nice if one was able to make one last run with a steam logo from, say, Mirandella down to Tira. And to make a film of doing that, I talked to the BBC and I've talked to uh, some independent television producers in Britain and they all thought it was a fabulous idea. It'd be great fun to do. The only problem is one's got to be able to get a locomotive and all the track and there's bits of track being taken up and so on. But it's the kind of thing that one can do to generate publicity and to generate things on a worldwide basis. There are, according to Steam Loco Info, 101 steam locomotives in Portugal, and some of which are probably in running order. This one, E214, was parked at Regula, and according to the plaque on it, it was restored uh, back in um, about 2000. So there are engines, there, are, there is infrastructure, there's a fantastic location. There's a whole community out there of people who would benefit from the activities of what could be done here if somebody actually has any interest in doing so, in developing what could be the centre of uh, a global community of people interested in railways coming here to tour, to spend their holidays working on railways, doing things to do with railways. <coughs> if it follows some, what has happened in Britain, that could work extremely well. 
It's a fantastic place. It's got a fantastic railway heritage. Much of it is still intact or could be resurrected without inordinately huge cost, but I don't know anything about the politics, I don't know anything about the, the potentials of that, but it seems to me there's something there. Let's do it. <laughs>